one tree is an icon of the British countryside. It is, of course, the oak. Today, we begin an extraordinary experiment. We want to understand this species as never before. And to do that, we will film this one remarkable specimen for an entire year. Armed with the latest technology, we will investigate how our oak battles to survive through four very different seasons. In autumn, we go underground to see how its root stocks up on precious resources. What we are looking at is a highly dynamic system. In winter, we discover the sophisticated strategies our tree uses to take on everything the elements can throw at it. In spring, we find out how it senses the world and how it even has its own form of language. It talks to itself. There's a chattering goes on across the whole canopy. And in summer, we'll see it fight predators hell-bent on eating it alive. Over the next 12 months, I want to see the world as our tree does and tell its amazing story. Wow! In the coming year, I can't predict exactly how well it'll fare, badly or well, but I can promise you one thing, you will never look at an oak tree in the same way again. As the temperature warms and the forest is bathed in sunlight, the countless plants and animals in Whiteham Woods come to life. Once again, the forest is reborn with color, movement, and life. And for our oak, this will be the season of most dramatic growth. After many months in a state of suspended animation, our oak is beginning to come to life. The buds are finally starting to burst, and our tree is about to undergo one of the most dramatic changes of the year. In the next few weeks, this oak is going to have an epic growth spurt. To capture this transformation, we are setting up two specially designed cameras. Bolted to the spot, they will take over 100 pictures each day and allow us to compress this spectacular event into a time scale we can appreciate. Just like our tree, the cameras will be powered by the sun and will capture images continuously for the next six months. With everything set, the cameras are started. winter ends and spring begins, over 700,000 individual leaves emerge across our oak. It's a truly astonishing change. This remarkable transformation needs huge amounts of water. Hidden from the naked eye, at its peak, our tree will be pumping 70 kilograms of water each hour out of the ground. By looking at the oak wood just beneath the bark with a microscope, we can see how this huge quantity of water gets moved around the tree. These intricate pipes are known as the xylem vessels and they run through a layer known as the cambium that carries water upwards from the roots to the leaves. And thanks to some ingenious technology, we can now measure exactly how much fluid is moving through them. With the help of Dr Lucy Rowland, 
I'm going to set up an experiment that I hope will reveal exactly how much water our tree is taking up and how this changes over the spring. This is a sat flow monitor, and as water travels up the xylem tissue, these probes heat it up. By measuring how quickly this heat is carried away, the device can calculate how much water is flowing through the trunk of the tree. Over 24 hours of measurements, we see our tree's water consumption varies dramatically. This is at night when we don't have sap flowing up between the tree. And this peak here, this is lunchtime-ish yesterday, when we have maximum flow up through the stem of the tree. And you can see here that we've got about 10 kilograms of water per hour yesterday lunchtime going up through the tree. And that will increase as the leaf area of the tree increases. Yeah, so the more leaves that come out on this oak over the next few weeks, the bigger that this peak is going to be. As we move through the next two weeks of spring, our tree begins to consume ever more water in the middle of the day. It reaches a peak of over 60 kilograms of water an hour as more and more leaves emerge. But leaves are not all our tree is now producing. It's now late April, and for a precious few weeks, our oak grows these strange new structures. Their role is to ensure the future of our tree and the continuing success of the oak. These fragile little objects are known as catkins, and they are oak's male flower, and it's the appearance of these every spring that signals the start of the oak's reproductive cycle. And if you look carefully inside each of these little blobs, you'll find it's completely packed with grains of pollen. But these pollen grains are only half the story. Our oak will also produce a female flower, but not until later in the spring. It means that these pollen grains will need to find a female oak flower on another tree if they want to pollinate. And that means taking to the skies. In spring, an oak tree like ours can release up to two billion individual particles of pollen. And inside each one of these tiny grains is the unique DNA of our tree. Blown around by the wind, they can spread for miles, but their mission is simple. Each grain is seeking a chance encounter with a female flower on one of the other 5,000 oak trees in the surrounding woods. Filling the air above the forest, Billions of our oak's individual pollen grains are scattered by the spring breeze. Up close, we can see how complex this tiny vessel really is. A thick, warty shell protects the delicate genetic cargo inside as gusts of wind carry it for miles. This is the target of our oak's pollen grains, a female oak flower. If the pollen is lucky enough to land here, it will fertilize the flower. And over the next few months, the female oak flower will combine its genetic material with the pollen to create a tiny acorn, a descendant of our oak. The yearly act of pollination is crucial for the long-term future of the oak. But at Whiteham, they have been using pollen to open up a unique window into its past. This is Marley Fen. It's an area of Whiteham woods that's remained largely unchanged for thousands of years. And over that time, as plants and trees reproduce every spring, the air is filled with trillions and trillions of pollen grains that eventually end up in this peat here. As pollen settles on the surface of the fen, plants, leaves, and other biological matter gradually build up on top of it. Over time, layer upon layer of pollen becomes preserved within the soil. Inside this somewhat unremarkable looking mud, an incredible story has been preserved, one that records in detail 
the ebb and flow of various trees and plants in the area for the last 12,000 years. But to uncover the story hidden in here, you have to dig down. And that's what Dr. Helen Walkington and her team have been doing for the last 10 years. They use a long metal tube to extract thin cylinders of peat from the fen. This four meter long core can tell scientists how the landscape and vegetation at Whiteham Woods has changed since the end of the last ice age. This soil, from four metres down, was on the surface 12,000 years ago and shows Britain then was a cold and barren place. So we've got here um, clay-rich material with lots of iron and fragments of rock. So I don't know if you can see here, but there are rock fragments within it. So it tells us that there was lots of erosion in this landscape. And that's how we know that there wasn't much vegetation at the time. Without plant roots to hold the soil in place, the landscape of Britain after the last ice age was prone to rapid changes. But as we move along the core, more and more pollen begins appearing as plants of all kinds take hold. As the climate warmed, it meant oak was able to move north, and 9,000 years ago, its pollen appeared for the first time at Whiteham. This material would represent um, organic matter that would have been moved into Marley Fen 9,000 years ago. And at the same time, oak pollen would be blowing around in the atmosphere and would settle out on the surface. And gradually, all the material in the rest of the core would be on top and pushed down. I find it incredible that I can actually put my finger on that piece of core and touch the exact part of the history of Whiteham where oaks came in. 9,000 that, years that's ago. 9,000 years ago. I can actually physically connect with that. Yeah. And what are um, humans doing at this time? At this time, uh, we don't have humans at this so point. Th this is it. This is pristine. Once the humans do come into, um, into the landscape, things start changing very quickly. Moving through the core to nearly 2,000 years ago, cereal grains begin to appear at Whiteham, and this signals a new type of human activity. Cereal grains are brought in by the Romans, and they need to completely clear the landscape to make space for fields to cultivate them. The cereals, we don't know the exact type of cereal that they were growing, because the shape of the pollen grains doesn't unlock that for us like it does for the trees, which we can get down to the species level. But certainly, yeah, the Romans would be using this landscape um, to grow food. And then as we progress up the core, we find that oak becomes less dominant. But it's at, still here. At this height. It's still present, but it becomes less dominant. And that's because humans have set about clearing these landscapes on a much, much greater scale. The oak tree that we're filming in White and Woods is going to be it growing probably, somewhere about here? Yeah, it was probably an acorn around 0.7 metres, something like that. Oh. And so over that, that represents the period of time that your oak tree's been, uh, been growing. But at least it shows that things, things change over time and th there have been huge, huge changes in 12,000 years, which is a very short piece of Earth's history. Absolutely. And in 12,000 years, those changes have been natural and human-induced, and there's a kind of interplay of those at this site, and I'm sure that in the next thousand years, that'll be the case as well. The oak's pollen offers us a vivid glimpse into challenges trees face over vast spans of time. But right now, our tree is gearing up to face a much more imminent danger. It's now late May, and our tree is in full leaf. The oak boughs visibly droop with the weight of the new material they have to support. But this abundance of young, soft leaves are extremely vulnerable. A great threat is now emerging, and our tree must react quickly if it wants to survive. This is the larva of the winter moth, it may not look very much, but this is one of the oak's most fearsome enemies. 
This little chap will eat an incredible amount of food to become adult. In fact, it will eat up to 27,000 times its own weight in young oak leaves. And right now, there are countless thousands of these caterpillars infesting our tree. But our oak isn't powerless in the face of this attack. After the oak's new leaves first emerge, for a short while, the winter moth caterpillars, amongst others, will gorge themselves. Unprotected from these attackers, our oak would struggle to survive the summer. But incredibly, our tree is actually able to recognize exactly what's happening to it and respond. Professor Sue Hartley has spent much of her career looking at the ways plants defend themselves against insect attacks and was one of the first to recognize just how sophisticated trees like our oak really are. How does an oak tree know it's being attacked? Well, that's really interesting. This is a winter moth and it's uh, about to tuck in and you can see that when they eat the leaf, they chew the edge and they're really messy eaters saliva's going all over the leaf. There's lots of goo on the leaf surface. And within that saliva, there are chemicals that the oak tree can recognize. While we might see or hear approaching danger, the oak senses it chemically. It's hard to appreciate as we have no analogous sense, but it's an incredibly fine-tuned and refined system. This chemical signaling is really sophisticated, so our oak tree can tell whether it's a caterpillar or whether it's a different kind of herbivore, like a sapsucker, an aphid that uh, feeds in a different way. And it's even better than that. The oak tree can tell the difference between big caterpillars and small caterpillars. The age of the caterpillar can be detected. That is amazing. Once our tree has sensed it's being attacked in one place, it's actually able to signal to itself to warn other parts of the attack. It produces something called wound hormones, and those hormones move all around the plant in the sap system, and that tells the plant to turn on its defences in other parts of the tree. And they also cause airborne signals to be released that also travel all around the tree. So, so it, the defences are ready all over the place. So if one branch, if, if that little branch there was suddenly attacked by lots of caterpillars, the tree would know and it would protect all the rest of itself? It would start to, yes. It talks to itself and there's a, a sort of chattering goes on across the whole canopy. Once our tree knows it's being attacked, it begins to produce poisons that will stop its attackers in their tracks. The main defences in oak are uh, chemicals called phenolics and tannins. Now, that, that's what you have in your teacup. I mean, that's, that's what gives tea uh, yeah. its taste. Tea contains a lot of tannin, and it's tannin that produces that bitter flavour in tea because the tannin um, binds with protein in your mouth, your saliva, and gives it that sort of bitter taste. And that's exactly what happens when the insects try and feed, they find that the chemicals in the oak leaves will bind to the proteins in that digestive system and stop them growing so well. So it may look like the tree is just a big green heap of food, but eating it's not that easy. It's a real challenge to eat plants. They're full of defences and they're very clever and they're able to detect the things that attack them. They've had millions of years to evolve to do that and they've got a very sophisticated armoury. After keeping the insect hordes of early spring at bay, our tree can continue its rapid growth. But now a new danger is emerging, an outlandish group of insects that have hijacked our oak's growth for their own ends. They are without doubt the strangest and most sophisticated foe our oak will face. This is a gall wasp. By laying its egg in a female oak flower, it causes a profound change in the way our tree grows. It induces a kind of tumor known as a gall to grow in place of an acorn. 
Inside the gall, a grub develops, feeding on the nutritious tissues within while being given shelter from enemies. This bizarre structure is the perfect nursery. This particular structure is known as a nopergol, and it is the product of just a single species of wasp. These wasps always produce this type of gall. But there are many other species of gall wasp, and they can induce very different shaped growths. The remarkable thing about galls is their sheer diversity. There are several hundred species of gall wasp, and each one makes a gall of a specific shape and size. But galls are not just random overgrowth of the oak. The gall wasps are actually using chemical signals in very subtle ways to hijack the developmental machinery of the oak at an early stage. The exact way each species of wasp manages to produce such individual and unique galls is still somewhat of a mystery. But it seems they may actually be altering the oak's DNA, genetically engineering it to grow a home for their young. The myriad of different types of structures these wasps create for their offspring is simply staggering. But of all the weird and wonderful types of oak gall, there's one that has a strange connection with the human race. One type of oak gall has shaped our history. That's because for a thousand years it was the source of a special kind of ink with which nearly all our historical documents were written. Crushed, mixed with water, iron sulphate and gum arabic, the humble home of the Andricus cholerae wasp is transformed into a cheap and extremely long-lasting ink. This is the National Archives at Kew. In the vaults of this building are housed over a thousand years of British history in the form of millions upon millions of documents. Stored in these unassuming boxes is our past, and a huge amount of it is recorded in gall ink. So almost any document of any importance had to be written or was written using ink made from oak gall. That's right. It's the most important ink that we have in Western history. What made it so good as an ink? It's an indelible ink, so it's very hard to remove. Um, you can see in some of uh, these documents here, uh, these are from the trial of Guy Fawkes. No. Yes. We're very the, lucky the to have them. The actual records? Yep, these are the actual records of Guy Fawkes' trial. And here you can see a nice example of, of how indelible the ink is. So here the scribe has made a mistake, and to correct his error, he's actually had to scrape the surface of the parchment off, remove the, the ink from the surface, and then rewrite over it. And you can see this dark patch here mm. and the difference in the colour because this part of the ink was put on much later. This is a really good illustration. These kinds of legal documents um, had to be kept in ink that was going to last, had to be written in ink that was going to be lasting. So they're written on material parchment that's more durable and they're written with an ink that is not gonna just vanish before your eyes. But oak gall ink wasn't just used for official documents. Everyone from poets, musicians and mathematicians to fine artists used this ink to record their thoughts, feelings, and ideas. The whole of Western civilization between, from about the end of the Roman period to the 19th century, our most important texts are in iron gall ink. It seems just a bizarre twist of fate that, that all of this, and there are how many thousands of documents here which are written in this ink, began because a, a, a tiny wasp laid an egg in an oak bud that grew into a gall, and that provided the basis for, essentially, our recorded history. That's right. What is surrounding us is just a small fragment of all the documents that survive from those 1,400 years of history. From wasp to gall 
to human hands. This little quirk of evolution has shaped human history. This incredible ink brought us the Magna Carta and the American Declaration of Independence. It has brought us the music of Mozart and Bach and the drawings of Rembrandt and Leonardo da Vinci. Thanks to Gall Inc, we have Isaac Newton's theories and the letters of Charles Darwin. Unwittingly, the oak tree has enabled us to record our past, to express our most profound ideas and to share our deepest emotions. In just three months, our tree has gone through a radical transformation. It has brought out its leaves, it has spread its pollen for miles around, and it has repaired the damage sustained over winter. Now, as the insect populations grow ever larger, this mighty organism is finally ready to face its most challenging season. It's now June, and under the intense sunlight, trees and plants are working at full capacity. For the countless life forms of the forest, it's a time of plenty. And at the center of this frenetic activity is our oak. Right now, it's literally being eaten alive. There are hundreds of insects that depend on the oak for sustenance, but I want to see the insects us humans don't normally come across. The ones that live high up in the oak's canopy. Well, it's now the height of summer, and the tree is in full leaf. There's even some acorns beginning to swell. This is just an enormous, cathedral-like space. What's very frustrating when you're on the ground is that you know there are lots of fantastic insects and animals, but you can't reach them. So the only way to get to them is to climb. I can just find a nice place to stand. Wow, there we are. Wow. This is a very privileged view of an oak tree and one that only an insect would have. There are some insects up here that you'll never see from the ground. I can just shake the foliage, try and get some insects in the bag. I'll bet there's lots of good stuff in here. Now the next bit of kit is the pooter that allows me to suck insects out of the net without handling them because lots of these things are very, very small. So let's see what we've got. High up in our tree, there is a wealth of life. This is where the good stuff will be. Mmm. To get a sense of its diversity and the unique adaptations of creatures up here, we have to take a closer look. And we can do that under the microscope. Now I've got quite a few insects in here. It will, I think we'll just empty them in there and just hope for the best. Great. I'll just, I'll just whack them in. Sure, it would be fun. <laughs> Big earwig there, look at that. 
What is absolutely amazing with this machine wow. is the quality of that image is, is just breathtaking. Well, that is the, the head end of a, a cricket, and she, she's having a preen here. The very interesting thing about these insects is that they have their ears on the front leg, on the knees of the front leg. And if I just, there we go, you'll see a little opening there. And that is the opening of her hearing organs, which are here and here. And by having their ears on their front legs quite far apart, you're able to triangulate and know exactly where that sound is from. Now, let's see if we can see anything else here. There are absolutely minute things in here. Tiny little thing, a mite, absolutely minute. And there are probably millions, tens of millions of these up a tree. That, that animal is tinier than the claw on the hind foot of the cricket. Right, now, <laughs> there are lots of bugs that suck sap and, and feed on the, on the green parts of the oak, but there are also quite a few bugs that, that feed on other insects. So it's a real ecosystem up here. There are carnivores, herbivores, all sorts of stuff. And that is a very young bug that basically sucks other bugs dry. So it's got this amazingly long curved beak, very sharp ended that comes down. And it basically hunts very gently in the leaves and it stalks animals, a bit like a, a lion would. And it impales them on the end of this sharp beak. And it then injects venom, which is in, in the form of enzymes, which paralyze the prey and begin to digest the prey. It then sucks the insides of the insect up. So all you'll find at the end of it is a little empty husk of whatever it ate. And <laughs> That, that's it there, right there. This spectacular variety of insects are all at their most active in summer, and many of them are specially adapted to eat our oak's leaves. This is a plant hopper, and it's able to suck out sugary sap from individual plant cells. When these sap suckers attack on mass, it can be devastating to the delicate leaves of our tree. There are many, many different insect species who call our tree home, but there are a select few who have a special relationship. Species that have evolved to specifically take advantage of the oak. This is one of our tree's infant acorns finally beginning to emerge. It's a beautiful, intricate structure. But something here is not right. This strange black hole is a sign this acorn has been tampered with. The culprit is one of the most highly specialized and bizarre species on the oak. The acorn weevil. Look at that. <laughs> is that not the, just the most beautiful thing? This is a, an animal that's evolved specifically with oak trees, and it, it lays its eggs in the acorns. And it's got this enormously long beak that comes out of its head. At the end of that beak are a pair of tiny jaws, and it drills deep into acorns to lay its egg in the acorn. And she, she has these peculiar and antennae, which are elbowed, hinged, and as she drills into the acorn, she, she can fold them back along the side of the head. Our weevil also has highly specialized bilobed feet, with which it's able to grip onto the smooth surface of the oak's acorns. Being able to see them this close brings you into their world. Yeah. You can understand the mechanics of what they have to do, how they have to live. It doesn't get any better than this, really. That is just evolution at its most wonderful. The acorn weevil is just one of many insects up our tree. On one single branch, there's a beautiful and deadly lacewing. Other insect predators, such as a damselbug, 
and a comb-footed spider, and the tussock moth caterpillar who can feast on our oak leaves. All of these insects have found ingenious ways to use the oak for their own ends and extract food from it in some way or other. And it's not just insects. Us humans also consume oak. In fact, we can drink it. To discover more about this, I'm going to the land of my forefathers, Scotland. This is the Scotch whisky experience in Edinburgh. With 3,384 different bottles, it's the world's largest whisky collection. To be legally called a Scotch whisky, the alcohol must be stored in oak barrels for at least three years. Whisky is, in essence, oak flavored alcohol. Does the growth of the oak tree affect what the whisky will eventually? Be. Yes, it, it absolutely can do. Generally, what happens in Quercus species is the tree lays down material in two distinct parts of the year. Springtime, it lays down early wood, which is like a sponge, very porous. The rest of the year, late wood, which is hard and dense. The early wood is more porous or spongy, therefore it can give forth more flavour. So if you're really fussy about the type of barrel you want to use, you will go for so-called tight-grained oak, typically 12 to 16 growth rings per inch if we're going to get very <laughs> specific about it. By treating oak barrels in different ways, by charring them and seasoning them with other wine and spirits, it's possible to release multiple chemical compounds from the oak, leading to an incredible diversity of whiskey flavors. So what we've got is, is actually a, a very complicated system. All these compounds which give flavor to the whiskey, how many different flavorings are there, would you think? I, I would say that there's probably between 50 and 100 different compounds we can identify that have come out of the oak wood that can influence the, the, the character and flavor of the whiskey. So when you drink your mature whiskey, all these lovely buttery flavors, the soft texture in the palate, the sweetness, the vanilla, the coconut, the almond, all of these flavors are drawn directly from the good quality oak wood. The multitude of flavors that whiskies possess are testament to the complexity of the oak's wood. From weevil to human, there are many hundreds of species that eat or consume the oak in some way. But what does our tree eat? Where does it get its energy from? The answer is, of course, the sun. And the way our tree does this is one of the greatest feats in the living world. The key to this lies within these little pea-like structures called chloroplasts. They're tiny, 10 thousandths of a millimeter across. There are hundreds crammed into every leaf cell and they give leaves their green color. These minute objects do something quite extraordinary. They use sunlight to turn carbon dioxide gas from the air and water from the soil into sugars, a process known famously as photosynthesis. As they photosynthesize, chloroplasts perform surely the most important biological process of all. They release oxygen without which all animals, including us, would die. I've long wanted to know how plants acquired this vital ability. Nick Lane is a specialist in the origins of life, and he has spent much of his career researching chloroplasts and how they evolved. He started by asking me to imagine the Earth when life first appeared, a time when it consisted solely of tiny, single-celled organisms like bacteria. It's hard to comprehend what the world must have been like three billion years ago before there was any oxygen at all, there wouldn't have been really any color beyond the reds of iron and things. It would have been more like Mars than, than the Earth, except that there were oceans and so on. But there were, no, there were no plants as such, there were no animals. Amazingly, for over two billion years, nothing much changed. Then suddenly, around 600 million years ago, chloroplasts, much like the ones in our oak leaves, appeared. 
It was the defining moment in the history of life. With chloroplasts inside cells turning sunlight into food, the rest of the cell around it grew bigger and much more complex. Life was now unshackled. It no longer existed only as bacteria, but was free to evolve into an unimaginable variety of shapes and forms. Once you had chloroplasts in these complex cells, somehow they did it better. They produced more oxygen, they changed. I, I think perhaps it was partly that they began to colonize the land. They came out of the water and they began to take over the terrestrial um, parts of the planet. They really changed the way that the world worked. So we had this long delay from three billion years ago when photosynthesis first started to only about six or seven hundred million years ago when, when, we, when the Earth went into some kind of convulsion. And then uh, the origin of animals, shockingly recently, if you're yeah. thinking about, uh, about these t billions of years periods, animals exploded into the fossil record on the back of oxygen, on the back of these chloroplasts taking over the world. So what's happening inside these tiny green peas, the chloroplasts, inside each of these leaves? where they harvest the sun's energy and produce food and oxygen as waste is the one, it's the single most important reaction on the face of the Earth. From the point of view of complex life, that's undoubtedly the case. Without, without that reaction, there would be no food to eat and there would be no oxygen to breathe. We simply would not exist. What I love about this story is it means that when I peer at the chloroplast in the cells of our oak tree, I'm looking directly at the most important event in the history of life. At the height of summer, our oak, its magnificent structure and its hundreds of thousands of leaves are able to bask in the sunlight and convert it into food. In the process, it pumps out the oxygen that we all rely on to stay alive. In this single act, our oak is performing a feat that we have yet to match. As August begins, it's now been a year since we made the first digital model of our tree. Thanks to the detailed measurements we've taken over the year, and the weather data from White and Woods, it's now possible to make estimates that reveal the ways our tree has changed. Despite its age, our tree has grown. Over the last 12 months, it has been extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through its leaves, and some of this has been refined into carbon and forged into new wood. While our oak's great size and age means that new growth is extremely thinly spread, it has increased in size. In fact, our tree has created 230 kilograms of new wood. This much material has literally been plucked from thin air. To help it grow and photosynthesize, our tree has had to consume huge quantities of water. Thanks to our sap flow data, we can see that over the 71 days we recorded it, the tree drank an incredible 58,822 litres of water. But our oak tree hasn't just taken from the environment around it. As it photosynthesizes, its leaves produce oxygen. Since we've been filming, our tree has released an incredible 234,000 litres of oxygen into the atmosphere, and that much oxygen is enough to keep me alive for a whole year. By spending a year looking at this one tree, we have been able to see just how dynamic and complex this organism really is. We've seen how it can create 700,000 leaves and keep them safe. We've seen how it can withstand the harsh winter conditions. And we've seen how our tree sits at the centre of a vast, interconnected web of life. In the face of everything thrown at it, the wind, the rain, freezing temperatures and the constant attack by insects and fungi, our tree has thrived. In the process, it's provided a home and a source of food for millions of individual organisms. It's what makes this incredible species such an important part of the British countryside. 
The oak's endurance and longevity have woven it into the lives of the thousands of creatures that rely on it. And that includes us. This colossus of the British Isles has permeated our culture. Oaks have shielded us, protected us from danger. They have allowed us to explore the seas. They have brought us pleasure. They have helped us express our most profound ideas. Oaks have borne witness to our deepest sorrows and our most joyful moments. This plant, perhaps more than any other, has become part of us.